So one of my favorite uh, shows for the NBA is Inside the NBA on TNT. Sh Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Ernie Johnson, Kenny Smith, and Charles Barkley. Uh, they do a great job. In 2004, Ernie, who kind of heads up that show, was shaving and he noticed a spot uh, by his uh, left ear and also one on his throat. So he went to the doctor and he was diagnosed with cancer. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Doctor says, I don't think we need to do anything right now. Just watch it. Uh, when it starts, if it starts to grow, then you need to come back in and see me. In 2006, Ernie was shaving again and he noticed the spot was much larger, much larger here. And uh, so he and his wife went in to see the doctor and he says, we've got to do chemo now. So we got to get that scheduled. So at that point, Ernie had not told anybody. And so he said, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, we got to tell people. And uh, he was doing the introduction of the players at the NBA All-Star Game. And he told his wife, DVR it. Let's take a look at, and, uh, at what it looks like. So when he got home that night in Atlanta, they looked at it. And he says, yeah, we got to tell people it's getting obvious now. And so he called in Charles Barkley and Kenny Smith individually and told them, and they just sat there and shook their heads. They said, Ernie, if you need anything, just ask. And so uh, one of the pregame shows uh, in 2006, he told the audience that he had cancer. And the response he got from his bosses at Turner Sports, David Levy and Jeff Benke, and fellow staffers at TNT, uh, calls and emails he got from NBA players and executives around the league and people in other sports, the support he got from his wife and four children, and the prayers and help he got from fellow church members in Atlanta helped him get through his chemotherapy and battle with cancer. It's now been 15 years He's either beat it or he's in remission. Uh, the social network of family, church, friends, and work help Ernie through his battle with cancer. And it illustrates the social capital we all need uh, to lead a happy and fulfilled life. This is the seventh in our series of messages called Fixer Upper. Just like Chip and Joanna Gaines turned worn out houses into dream houses. We're looking at what the Bible teaches about how we can fix up our minds so that we can learn to think Christianly. Think the way God wants us to think. Think in such a way that we can lead happier lives. The Apostle Paul writes to the Philippians from a jail cell in Rome. In spite of his circumstances, he talks 19 times about his joy. Even though he was opposed and hated everywhere he went to plant churches, he didn't become bitter toward people. The Apostle Paul illustrates that our circumstances and people in our lives don't determine our happiness. By the way we think, we determine whether or not we're happy or unhappy. So turn in our text today. It's Philippians Chapter 2, 19 to 30 in your Bible, or if you want to use our Bibles, it's on page 1,180. One of the reasons Paul was able to talk about his joy and his happiness, even though he was in prison, was because he had a close-knit family of friends and fellow workers who prayed for him and supported him. People like Barnabas, Luke, Silas, John Mark, Priscilla and Aquila, Aristarchus, Epaphras. If you look at Romans chapter 16, he identifies at least 24 people who were close friends of his in the church in Rome. And here in our text, he mentions Timothy and Epaphroditus. We'll start at verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. Paul first met Timothy on his first missionary journey in Lystra. 
I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. When Paul tells the Roman Christians about his concern for the Philippians, apparently Timothy is the only one who raised his hand and said, I'll go and visit them. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul notices that most people only look out for their own interests. One of the keys to leading a happy and fulfilled life we've seen in this series is making Christ, serving Christ, your primary interest. You make serving him and people your primary concern. That's the way Timothy was. Uh, verse 22. <coughs> Once you read this with me. But you know that Timothy has proved himself... So Timothy is one of Paul's most constant companions. He has served with Paul in Lystra, Berea, Thessalonica, Philippi, Corinth, and Ephesus. Now, he's serving with Paul in Rome. Uh, Timothy is such a good friend that Paul refers to him like a son to a father. Read with me verse 23. I hope, therefore... <clears throat> so Paul expects he's going to be released from prison and be able to visit uh, the Philippians. Now in verse 25, he introduces Epaphroditus. Read this with me. But I think... Epaphroditus is from Philippi. He's the one that brought the gift of the financial support from the, uh, the Philippians to Paul in Rome. We read about that in uh, Philippians 4.18. Read this with me. I have received full payment. Now, Epaphroditus has brought the gift. Now he stays in Rome to serve Paul there in the church in Rome. Uh, let's read 26 together. For he longs for all of you. Epaphroditus apparently worked so hard for the gospel in the church in Rome that he got sick and he nearly died. But Epaphroditus is not worried about himself. He's worried about the uh, Philippians that would be so worried about him. So he asked Paul, send me back to, uh, to Philippi. Now let's read verse uh, 28. Therefore, I am all the more eager... So Paul tells the Philippians, please welcome him back with joy. Uh, he's, he's, he's concerned that they might see him as a deserter, leaving Paul uh, early. And, uh, and they said, please welcome him back. Timothy and Epaphroditus are, are two of Paul's best friends in Rome. So I want to talk today about the importance of friends. Uh, friendship is an important part of happiness. I want to say two things about the importance of friends. One, friends protect us from harm. As Solomon writes in Proverbs 27, wounds from a friend can be trusted. A friend will tell you, don't do that. That would not be a good idea. They protect us from harm. Uh, guardrails uh, protect us from going off the road uh, into a danger area. 
guardrails are always put in the safe zone. I mean, there's no point of having it in the danger zone halfway down the cliff after you've already gone off the edge. So guardrails are always put in a safe zone. We need guardrails in our lives uh, to protect us from going astray into areas that are bad for us. Uh, we need guardrails in our friendships. We also need moral and financial guardrails. Uh, Dan Sides led us in a, a course of Dave Ramsey, January through March this year. He did a great job, and it was basically a class in guardrails, things to do financially, things not to do. Our culture doesn't value the idea of guardrails. Uh, our culture doesn't like any rules whatsoever. They want us to be completely free of that. Our culture is just content with painted lines on the side of the road. But it's been so important to establish guardrails in our friendships. Uh, when I talk about friendships, I'm talking about your friends at school, uh, your friends at work, maybe friends in your neighborhood, uh, people you hang with, uh, friends in your family. Family is an important part of our social network. Friends in church. When you were growing up, you may have felt your parents, grandparents, you know, were very concerned about who you spent time with. Maybe it drove you crazy. But now some of you are parents, and now you get it. You understand that your friends can determine the direction of your life. Marin Cerf is a neuroscientist at Northwestern University, and he tells us that People we spend time with, our brain waves begin to look alike. We begin to think like the people we spend time with. Listen to what he says. Just being next to other people actually aligns your brain with them. If people want to maximize happiness, that's what we're talking about in this series, and minimize stress, that's what we're talking about in this series. They should build a life that requires fewer decisions by aligning themselves with people who embody the traits they prefer. Over time, they'll naturally pick up those desirable attitudes and behaviors. David's son Solomon says basically the same thing. He was called the wisest man who ever lived uh, other than Jesus Christ. Walk with the wise and become wise. Solomon says, you spend time with people who make good decisions and you'll increase the likelihood that you'll make good decisions. He goes on, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Now this surprises us. We expect him to say, walk with the wise and become wise for companions of fools becomes a fool. But he doesn't say that. He says, oh no, it's way worse. You suffer harm. You'll actually get hurt by their bad, uh, bad decisions. I have a friend whose son was a senior in high school, like Dylan. And uh, he uh, was at a party, took a girl with him. Lots of drinking. Lots of marijuana, lots of harder drugs. And he says, let's get out of here. She said, okay. So they're getting in the car. And just as they're getting in, she says to him, can my friend come too? Never met him before. He says, well, I guess. So they're driving along and they come to, they see a guy at an ATM machine. He says, stop here. He gets out of the car and holds this guy up with a gun. And the guy was quick enough to call 911, and the police came quickly, and they arrested the guy. They also arrested my friend's son as an accomplice. He didn't even know the guy, but he went to jail. That's why I always tell my kids, don't pick up a hitchhiker. You don't know who you're picking up. Don't ever drive somebody in your car that you don't know who they are. I mean, you could get stopped for some reason, and they bolt, they leave, uh, you know, marijuana or, you know, drugs in your car. You're the one that's going to get 
arrested. So if you realize the people you're hanging around with are moving in a direction you don't want for your life and they're pushing you to compromise, you should recognize you're running up against a guardrail. When you find yourself thinking, I'll go, but I won't participate, that should be a guardrail in your mind. I mean, would you agree with this with your 14-year-old daughter? Daddy, you know, they're going to be doing bad stuff at this party, but I won't participate. Oh, okay, fine. You have fun, honey. Of course not. You would say, you got two options. One, you don't go. Or two, I go with you. Wouldn't that be fun? Jesus says something. Uh, this is a, one of these passages Jesus shares that you've probably missed. Um, you just kind of read right through it. Uh, but he says, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. He says, you can argue with guardrails all day long. You can argue with your parents and say, your rules are so stupid. But in the end, wisdom will have the final say. Choosing the right friends can protect you from harm. The second thing I want to say about the importance of friends is that friends bring us happiness. The Apostle Paul talks over and over again in this book about his happiness one of the reasons for his happiness is friends like Timothy and Epaphroditus who served him in Rome. Happiness studies today show that the happiest people are those who have friends, family, and church. The unhappiest people are those who are alone and don't go to church. They're proving what God said long ago, it is not good for the man to be alone. Life expectancy in the U.S. grew, uh, increased steadily from the 1900s until 2015. Then it began to go down. It's like the health of our country hit a brick wall. Why? Has all to do with drugs, alcohol, and suicide. Mostly men. are drugging themselves and drinking themselves to death due to a growing sense of isolation. In the 1960s, people said, most people can be trusted. The modern consensus is, I can't trust anybody. I came walking in today with a, a sports bag, and Micah said to me, why, you, why do you have that? I said, well, that's my baptism stuff. And uh, I said, the thing that always kind of bothers me on baptism Sundays is I leave my wallet and my phone in the bathroom. So I decided, you know, I'll just carry a bag with me today and take it. Uh, anyway. Proof that the suicide rate has to do with isolation is demonstrated in this, the states with the highest per capita suicide rate are Wyoming, Alaska, and Montana, the least densely populated states in our nation. Washington, D.C. and New Jersey have the lowest suicide rates and they're their most densely populated. Isolation has increased uh, as people have found more and more of their entertainment and privacy in their own homes that have become more of a retreat from society rather than a connection to it. Americans are buying bigger homes. The average new home in 2015 was 2,700 square feet. In 1982, the average new home was 1,700 square feet. So where do we find meaningful friendships and relationships that bring us happiness? One of the best places is church. Research suggests that religious people are happier than less religious people. Half of people who attend church more than once a week say they are very happy. Only 25% of people who attend church once a year or less say they are very happy. Of those who attend church regularly, they say more than half our friends are from the church. I mean, this is one of the best arguments for church there is. 
Come to church and you're going to be happier and you're going to find friends. This is one of the reasons, parents, I think it's so important to help your kids, urge your kids to bring friends with them to church and the youth group, the summer camps that Chris is talking about, and to our community Bible camp. Many of you tell me, you know, my kids say that they feel like they're the only Christian at school. Well, if you have a, a kid, have them bring a friend to community Bible camp. Increase the likelihood that they'll have a, another friend who's a Christian. So, how can, uh, how do you make friends at a church? Uh, I, I think there are probably four main ways. One is uh, through service. You volunteer to do something and you're going to be working with other people and you're going to get into conversations and you may find a new friend. Another way is to, uh, by getting in one of our community groups. Take your program out. We have a yellow sheet in there that lists our community groups. I see it all the time. People that are in community groups together forge great friendships. I just see them talking. And Another way is what I call hospitality. That's our whole food after the service thing. Hang around and you'll meet people. I see people sitting around eating with other people. They've established friendships. They eat together every week. The last way is by getting into a discipleship relationship or one of our discipleship groups. Great way to form friendships. Mark Burnett is one of the greatest producers in television history. He's the genius behind The Apprentice, Survivor, Shark Tank, and The Voice. He's married to Roma Downey, who was the star of Touched by an Angel, and together they produced The Bible on the History Channel. Very successful. I don't know anyone who lives out the adage, go, uh, uh, go big or go home better than Mark Burnett. Erwin McManus, in his book, The Last Arrow, uh, was asking uh, Mark how he had been able to achieve success repeated, <coughs> repeatedly. He, in his answer, he never mentioned anything about himself. He only mentioned his team. He says, I've had the same team through the years. To the outsider, you'd say, why has he had so much success? Well, of course, it's all about Mark Burnett. But the truth is, he has surrounded himself with a great team. This is where many of us miss the boat. We've been misled, misled to believe that if we have potential for greatness in us, it means we don't need people to help us achieve greatness. In fact, some, uh, in, in some sense, our sense of greatness may actually cause us to diminish or demean the people around us. We think that life is either a sprint or a marathon. And in either case, we're the only runner that matters. But the truth is, or more likely, it's better to think of life as a relay in which if we win, we have to have a team that's going to get us across the finish line. It's interesting that the most iconic shows that Mark Burnett brought to the screen are The Survivor, or Survivor and The Apprentice. Both are shows about teaming and working together. If you're going to success, if you're going to win as an individual, you have to win as a team. There's an ancient African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. The Apostle Paul internalized this truth. Uh, Portland Community Church has a great team. I'm so proud of our staff. Micah Page leads our, our worship ministry, everything you see that go on up here. In fact, he's in charge of every minute of the service, uh, putting it together every week. He's in charge of all of our tech, Sound, lighting, PowerPoint, our website, our social marketing. Um, and then uh, I think the thing I like about him the best is just his teamness. He, you know, he, he jumps in and helps with anything going on in the church. 
doesn't matter if it's in his job description. He's just, he's just part of making things happen around here. Chris Quinn's in charge of our youth ministry. Kids love him. Parents of our teenagers love him. He also leads our college young singles group. He's also in charge of uh, uh, producing uh, this. Uh, he, he oversees the team of people that write this. He edits uh, uh, every one. I think he writes some of the chapters uh, sometimes. Beth Werner is in charge of our children's ministry, Kids Space. She knows children very well. And parents of kids love her. Jen Morgan helps her. Christine Langele is supposed to be my assistant, but basically I think she kind of runs the church. I mean, she makes sure everything's happening. She schedules all events here. Uh, she's just kind of, she jumps in anywhere. I, she, she put this up here today. We're having a baptism and filled it with water. Let's check it out. It's pretty warm, huh? Nice. <laughs> so... Um, and then we have Sam Rich. Sam's in charge of our facilities and grounds. He can fix anything. He was a professional a landscaper and knows everything about keeping things nice outside. We just have a great team. The Apostle Paul had a team. Timothy, Epaphroditus, John Mark, Silas, Aquila and Priscilla, Aristarchus, Epaphras. They worked with him helped him, encouraged him, prayed for him, and they brought him great joy. Friendship is an important part of happiness. Life is too hard to go it alone. Like Ernie Johnson, who was helped through his battle with cancer by family, church, and friends and work associates, we need a social network in order to experience true happiness. Being in church today, you're in the right spot. This is the one, the one place in this world where you're most likely to find friends. And the support you need to find true happiness. Lord God, thank you for this text where the Apostle Paul explains his joy his happiness, that part of it is due to his friends that supported him. And we see the importance that we need friends to protect us from harm and to bring us the social network uh, that we need to experience real happiness, to help us pass discouragement and depression. Thank you for Paul's example. We want to follow it. So why don't you tell God right now, why don't you just kind of review what's your social network look like? Is it strong? There's a pretty lean. Tell him you'd like to develop it and find more friends and better relationships. You pray right now. Lord, today you show us the importance of family and friends and church family and help us all to develop that in our lives so that we can get past the difficult days, uh, the tough times, uh, through the encouragement and the prayers of friends. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.